Welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology, Chapter 25, Ergogenic Aids. The objectives of this chapter are to 1. Define ergogenic aid, 2. To explain why a placebo treatment in a double-blind design is used to research studies involving ergogenic aids, 3. To describe in general the effectiveness of nutritional supplements on performance, 4. To describe the effect of additional oxygen on performance, distinguish between hyperbaric oxygenation and that accomplished by breathing oxygen-enriched gas mixtures, five, to describe blood doping and its potential for improving endurance performance, six, to explain the mechanism by which ingested buffers might improve anaerobic performances, seven, to explain how amphetamines might improve exercise performance, eight, to describe the various mechanisms by which caffeine might improve performance, 9. To identify the risk associated with using chewing tobacco to obtain a nicotine. And 10. To describe the physiological and psychological effects of different types of warm-ups. For those of you taking notes, this outline will help you to follow the structure of the lecture. 1. Research design concerns. 2. Dietary supplements. 3. Aerobic performance. 4. Anaerobic performance. 5. Drugs. And 6. Physical warm-up. To begin, we look at ergogenic aids, which are substances or phenomena that are working, producing, and believed to increase performance. These would include nutrients, drugs, warm-up exercises, hypnosis, stress management, blood doping, oxygen breathing, music, and extrinsic biomechanical aids. Now, when looking at research design, there are several concerns to address. One is the amount of the substance to be used. Too little or too much may not show an effect. In addition, the subject may be effective in untrained but not trained subjects and or vice versa. And the quote unquote value as determined by the subject depends on their goals. The next concern is the task, which is an endurance versus a short term event or a large motor versus a fine motor activity. And finally, the use may enhance short-term performance, but compromise long-term performance. In addition, we need to look at a placebo, which is a look-alike substance containing nothing that will improve performance, other than the athlete's belief in the substance may influence the performance. This is why double-blind studies are used, where neither the investigator nor the subjects are aware of who is receiving the treatment. The following chart represents the changes in performance and the placebo effect. You can see that there is a perceived improvement due to the placebo effect. In summary, ergogenic aids are defined as substances or phenomena that are work producing and are believed to increase performance. Due to the fact that an athlete's belief in a substance may influence performance, scientists use a placebo or look-alike substance to control for this effect. In addition, scientists use a double-blind research design in which the investigator and the subject are both unaware of the treatment. Moving on to dietary supplements, there is little evidence that dietary supplements improve performance with the exception of creatine. Despite this, 80% of these athletes use supplements. Looking at the Dietary Supplements Health Education Act of 1994, we see a legislated in the lack of regulation of dietary supplements. And we see that supplements may contain contaminants. For example, anabolic steroids, which could lead to a positive drug test. In the table below, we see the dietary supplements for strength trainers. Please reference table 25.1 in your book. And this is a continuation of the dietary supplements for strength trainers. Now looking specifically at creatine monohydrate, we see that there's an increase in muscle phosphocreatine due to supplementation, which is useful for short-term explosive exercises. We see that the supplementation increases the muscle creatine levels. By using a 20 to 25 gram per day loading dose, we see approximately a 20% increase in muscle creatine. There's also a 2 to 5 gram per day maintenance dose, where 5 grams per day appears to be safe for chronic consumption. We see that the creatine improves the ability to maintain force and power output. It also increases muscle mass due to more water retention than protein synthesis, and the side effects 
which are some reported, but not long-term adverse effects. In summary, for the most part, there is little evidence that dietary supplements provide a performance advantage to athletes, with the possible exception of creatine. Now looking at oxygen, oxygen increases the pressure of oxygen in the blood. If we look at a hyperbaric chamber, we are breathing air under a higher pressure, 20% or higher of oxygen. There is no evidence of pr improved performance, however, where an individual is conducting an endurance run on a treadmill or weightlifting. Now if we use increased percentage oxygen mixtures, breathing greater than 21% of the oxygen mixture at atmospheric pressure, we see an improved time to exhaustion and throughout the range of the inspired percentage of oxygen. So looking at the effect of the pressure of oxygen on performance, where you have O2 enriched gas versus a hyperbaric chamber, we see that you have an increase in performance due to enriched gas, but not oxygen in the hyperbaric chamber. Now looking at oxygen prior to exercise, there is a rationale is to store up oxygen in the blood. We cannot really increase oxygen bound to hemoglobin, however. We see that 97% is saturated at rest, and we see that an increase by only 3% of breathing at 100% of oxygen. Now we can increase the O2 dissolved in plasma, where dissolved oxygen increases from 3 to 21 milliliters of oxygen per liter, with an extra 100 milliliters of oxygen stored in the blood. However, the blood oxygen returns to normal level within a few breaths of air. However, there is some evidence that O2 breathing prior to exercise improved performance in short events. This must take place within a couple minutes of the event, but it is not practical for athletes. Now looking at oxygen during exercise, the rationale is to prevent muscle hypoxia by delivering additional oxygen. What we see is an increase in oxygen content in arterial blood is balanced by the decrease in the blood flow to the muscles. No real increase in oxygen delivery to the muscle takes place. We only see a 2 to 5% increase in VO2 max. However, there is an increase in time to exhaustion. This seems to be beneficial in athletes who experience desaturation during exercise. Also, high pressure, partial pressure of oxygen slows glycolysis and reduces lactate and hydrogen ion formation. Again, this is not practical for use in performance. Finally, looking at oxygen after exercise, the rationale is to spend re speed recovery and to be ready for a second bout of exercise. Early results suggest that it works. However, the subjects knew they were breathing oxygen. Later research showed no benefit, with no improvement in recovery heart rate, ventilation, or post-exercise VO2, and no improvement in subsequent performance. In summary, Oxygen breathing before or after exercise seemed to have little to no effect on performance, while oxygen breathing during an exercise improves endurance performance. Now looking specifically at bud doping, it is the infusion of red blood cells to increase hemoglobin concentrations and oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. You can have an autologous transfusion where you use the subject's own blood or a homologous transfusion where you use a matched donor. The effects of infusion of 900 milliliters of blood increases the hemoglobin 8 to 9 percent, increases the VO2 max 4 to 5 percent, and tends to increase performance anywhere from 3 to 34 percent. The effects last for 10 to 12 weeks. Here is a chart that shows the changes in hemoglobin levels following the removal and refusion of red blood cells. Now looking more at blood doping, we see the use of erythropoietin or EPO. This is a hormone that stimulates red blood cell production. It is actually used as a part of therapy in chemotherapy or dialysis patients, and it can lead to extremely high red blood cell counts. However, this has led to death in some athletes. In addition, there is testing for EPO use or red blood cell infusion in athletes, where they track athletes' blood over years to detect sudden changes in the amounts. In addition, there are artificial oxygen carriers, or hemopures, but these are not shown to improve performance. In summary, blood doping refers to the reinfusion of red blood cells in order to increase the hemoglobin concentration and the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Due to improvements in blood storage techniques, blood doping has been shown to be effective in improving VO2 max and endurance performance.
Now looking at anaerobic performance, we see that the emphasis is on buffering hydrogen ion release from the muscles. The blood buffers, in particular, sodium bicarbonate, enhances the ability to buffer hydrogen ions during exercise. This improves performance of 1 to 10 minutes in duration or repeated bouts of high intensity exercise. However, no benefit for tax, tasks less than one minute. We see that the optimal dose is 0.3 grams times the kilogram body weight with one liter of water. Evidence of placebo effect is seen in some studies. In addition, large doses can lead to side effects such as diarrhea and vomiting. In summary, the ingestion of sodium bicarbonate improves performance of 1 to 10 minutes in duration or repeated bouts of high intensity exercise. Now moving on to amphetamines, we see that they have a simple path mimetic effect, which is a catecholamine-like effect. What they do is they cause an increased arousal and perception of increased energy and self-confidence. This leads to an improved performance in fatigue subjects only, however. There is no improvement in alert non-fatigue subjects. Now looking at beta-2 agonists such as clarbutamol and salbutamol, we see that clarbutamol activates beta-2 receptors and airways to treat asthma. This is an anabolic agent with a 10 to 20% increase in muscle mass. We see that type 1 or type 2 fiber conversions, hypertrophy of type 2 fibers, and it is used by athletes in power events such as sprinting and football. If we look at salbutamol, we see an inhaled beta-2 agonist to treat asthma as well, but ingested, it improves performance and super maximal exercise. Both are associated with severe side effects, however. In summary, amphetamines have a catecholamine-like effect that leads to an increased arousal and a perception of increased energy and self-confidence. While amphetamines improve the performance of fatigue subjects, they do not have this effect on alert, motivated, non-fatigue subjects. Now looking at caffeine, it may improve performance at the muscle or nervous system or the delivery of the fuel to the muscle. It can elevate blood glucose and increase fat utilization. It can also decrease perception of fatigue and lower rate of perceived exertion during prolonged exercise. The effect is variable and dose related, however, and the effect may diminish in regular users. The potential side effects are insomnia, diarrhea, anxiety, and irritability. There's also the potential for a diuretic effect. There's also the idea of using a caffeine ephedrine mixture. In table 25.2, we see all the sources of caffeine. Please reference your book for this table. In addition, here are the factors influenced by caffeine that might improve performance, such as improvement in the central nervous system, heart and skeletal muscle, as well as mobilization of glucose and fat. And this is a diagram of the mechanisms by which caffeine may increase fatty, or excuse me, free fatty acid mobilization. In summary, caffeine can potentially improve performance at the muscle or in the central nervous system or in the delivery of fuel for muscular work. Caffeine can elevate blood glucose and simultaneously increase the utilization of fat. Caffeine's ergogenic effect on performance is variable and appears to be dose-related and less pronounced in subjects who are daily users of caffeine. Now looking at nicotine, we see that it is found and received by smoking or chewing tobacco. However, smoking leads to cancers in the heart and the lung diseases. In addition, chewing tobacco causes diseases of the mouth, including oral cancer. However, nicotine can stimulate both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Small doses increase the autonomic activity, while large doses actually block the autonomic responses. What we see in the cardiovascular or the GI effects are increases in heart rate, a higher RMR, or an increased cardiovascular response to light exercise. In the diagram below, we see the relaxing and stimulating effects of nicotine. In summary, in summary, nicotine has varied effects depending on whether the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system is stimulated. The use of smokeless tobacco, however, can cause dental caries, gum disease, and oral cancers. Finally, looking at physical warm-up, we see the causes of both physiological and psychological changes that are beneficial to performance. 
there's an increase in muscle temperature, arousal, and focus on the event. Warm-up activities might include identical to the performance, be directly related to the performance, or just be a general warm-up. Recommendations are for short-term performances less than 10 seconds of a maximal effort to be done at 40 to 60 percent of the VO2 max for 5 to 10 minutes, followed by 5 minutes of recovery. This may reduce the high energy phosphates. For intermediate term performances, greater than 10 seconds but less than 5 minutes, the recommendations are at 60 to 70 percent of VO2 max for 5 to 10 minutes, followed by less than 5 minutes of recovery. The goal to begin performance with a slightly elevated VO2. And for long-term performance is greater than 5 minutes, the recommendation is at 60 to 70 percent of the VO2 max for 5 to 10 minutes. Too much may deplete muscle glycogen and increase thermal strain. Now looking at stressing, we see that it increases joint flexibility, increases the muscle tendon compliance, and we can ask the question whether it reduces the risk of injury. There is little support for this, however, in literature, and stretching outside periods of exercise may actually reduce the risk for injury, however, but stretching just prior to exercise does not. In summary, warm-up activities can be identical to performance, directly related to performance, or indirectly related to performance in just a general warm-up. Warm-up causes both physiological and psychological changes that are beneficial to performance. That concludes the content for Chapter 25. The following are study questions to help you test your understanding of the knowledge. Question 1. What is an ergogenic aid? Question 2. Why must an investigator use a placebo treatment to evaluate the effectiveness of an ergogenic aid? 3. Provide a brief, brief summary of the role that the dietary supplements play in improving performance. 4. What is a double-blind research design? 5. Does breathing 100% oxygen improve performance or recovery? 6. Breathing hyperoxic gas mixtures improves performance without changing O2 delivery in tissues. How is this possible? 7. What is blood doping and why does it appear to improve performance now when it did not in the earlier investigations? 8. How might ingested buffers improve short-term performances? 9. Although amphetamines improve performance in fatigued individuals, they might not have this effect on motivated subjects. Why? 10. How might caffeine improve long-term performances? Can the results be extrapolated to quote-unquote real performances in the field? 11. Chewing tobacco might provide a nicotine quote-unquote high, but not without risks. What are they? And 12. Describe the different types of warm act activities and the mechanisms by which they improve performance. This concludes Chapter 25 on Ergogenic Aids. Please reference this lecture and your textbook to further study the material and answer questions. Also, please feel free to email me at any time. Thanks.